the last time I was in London was for Anderson Silva versus Michael Bisping at the O2 in 2016. If you would have told me in 2016, like a few years later, Anderson would be fighting some, you know, Disney kid. If I'm being honest, I think uh, this country is a little too hard on Anthony Joshua. I think he's done a lot to represent this country. Today, we are fortunate enough to be joined by the biggest name in combat sports media, Ariel Helwani. Ariel, how are you doing? I 100% disagree with your statement there, but <laughs> it is great to be here. Thank you for having me. How would you define yourself if not that? Wanker? No, I just learned <laughs> that word here. You're in the UK for WWE's Clash at the Castle, which yes. of course is live on BT Sport. This is the first pay-per-view or premium live event that the WWE are hosting in the UK for about 30 years. September 1992, I think, was SummerSlam, the last time the WWE were in the UK. So how does it feel to be part of an event of, of that magnitude? Well, there's a lot of emotions here. First of all, I watched that event back in 1992. Bret Hart was my favorite, is my favorite, um, as far as wrestling is concerned, and also one of my favorite athletes, period. I mean, I adored him. Before I knew anything about pro wrestling, real, not real, script, I, I thought he was superhuman. So I remember that event, especially because it was like a family feud, so to speak. And uh, it was in this outdoor stadium, Wembley, massive crowd. So to be back 30 years later, and now covering it for BT. This is a huge honor for me. I've been working for BT for a year now, a little over a year. And uh, you know, when I was looking at what I would possibly do after leaving ESPN, I basically just sat back and said, who do I wanna work for? Who seem like great people to work with? Who seem like creative people, fun people, loyal people? Like this is what I was really searching for. Who would make your list of the perhaps top five British wrestlers of all time? Uh, I had to do a list. And, Did you? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, for the BT Sport WWE page. And uh, a lot of people were very mad at me for this list. Now here's the thing. This is my personal list. Like they were coming at me with this, with that. Oh, how can you do? I was like, yo, it says Ariel's personal favorite, you know, like this is my list. How could you tell me that I'm wrong? It's my personal preference. It's like us going to an ice cream shop and I say I like cookies and cream. You say you like cookie dough and you say I'm wrong for liking cookies and cream. It's my personal preference. So um, off the top of my head, I, I had Davey Boy Smith as number one. I had um, Dynamite Kid. I actually wanted to put Dynamite Kid number one because I actually thought he was the better wrestler, but the bigger star was mm. British Bulldog. Uh, but the British Bulldogs as a tag team were incredible. Matilda, what a legend. Um, I had, uh, who else did I have? I had Drew up there, and obviously if things go his way on Saturday, he could go up a little higher. Um, William Regal up there as well. I had Fit Finley up there because he is, he's from Northern Ireland, so that is, right, part of the UK. Contentious no. issue, but yes, technically. Technically it is. <laughs> technically. So I had fit in there. Some people were upset about that. Also had uh, Lord Alfred Hayes in there, uh, the legend. Uh, Nigel McGuinness was in there. Paige was in there. Um, and I'm forgetting a couple off the top of my head. Big Daddy. Uh, so some people were upset that some of the newer guys weren't in there, like Will Ospreay. And uh, who else were they mad at me about? But like, you know, again, my personal preference, these are the guys that I respect, watch, like. And, uh, but ultimately, I think Davy Boy deserves to be number one because he was the biggest star of the bunch. In the UK, we're still kind of going through the fallout of Anthony Joshua versus Alexander Usyk. What did you make of that fight? And uh, in particular, AJ's reaction to suffering defeat? I could talk 30 minutes about this. Uh, I mean, obviously Usyk won fair and square, uh, just as he did back in September of last year. Uh, it just seems like Joshua can't figure him out, changed, you know, training camps, coaches, all that stuff. I, I think if they fight 10 times, maybe he wins once. Uh, Usyk is just a bad matchup for him. But obviously, everything was overshadowed by his post-fight quote-unquote antics. Honestly, I had no problem with it. I think, I think if I'm being honest, I think uh, this country is a little too hard on Anthony Joshua. I think he's done a lot to represent this country on the grandest of stages. And this is a guy who has been almost like suffocating because he's been so you know, perfectly sculpted and, 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 and cultivated and, and crafted into this like little PR, you know, vessel, right? And I think he just cracked. I think he just had a moment where he lost for the second time. He's not gonna win the belts. He's not gonna get the Fury fight, at least not for now. It could definitely happen in the future still. And I think he just had a moment where he just cracked. And by the way, in that moment, 
sure, you want to play like the semantic game and say, oh, he took away Usyk's shine, oh, he should have let him speak for, fine, fair, but number one, none of us have been in his shoes. No one knows the pressure that this guy deals with. I don't care how much money he makes. There's an immense amount of pressure on his shoulders in particular, uh, more so than any boxer in this region, including Tyson Fury, if you ask me. He is more scrutinized, in my opinion, than Tyson Fury. And so he had this moment where he just kind of like let it all out, and I thought it humanized him. And by the way, in that moment, what did he do 90% of the time? He put over Usyk. He was talking about him, how great he was to respect him and all this stuff. So I say everyone chill out. Uh, I think most fighters could probably relate to him in that moment and understand where he was coming from. He had a moment where he was just a human being who cracked, who was letting his emotions out, who just kind of like, I almost felt like he was just like exhaling for the first time in 10 years. And so it didn't bother me and I would tell everyone who was bothered by that to lighten up. It was an authentic reaction whether you agree or like it or not, wasn't right. it? It was him being himself and people have been... I feel like it's the same people that have been telling Anthony Joshua to show a bit of personality that are then kind of lambasting him for doing that, right? albeit on the biggest stage. 100%. It's going to take a lot for me to be critical of a fighter who shows that kind of emotion because, look, you know, fighters aren't perfect. They do criminal things. They do stupid things. Like, they deserve criticism. But if that's the worst that he does, oh, he took the mic first. Oh, he dropped the belts. Come on. Like... Again, we have no idea what these men feel, what these women feel, what they go through, the mental grind. Like nothing pisses me off more when they say, oh, uh, this guy got paid a million dollars for six minutes of work. Let's say it's like a quick fight. Like, no, he didn't. That's you not appreciating the actual journey to get to that fight, the three months of training camp, the Sunday mornings, the training, the road work, the, the, the sparring sessions. Like it's an insane job. And they put themselves through hell just to make it to the fight, and then it's hell in the fight to try to win and to move on with your career. So I have, if people want to call me biased about anything, I will always be biased towards fighters. I will always have their back because I really don't feel like we truly appreciate what they put themselves through, more so than any athlete on the planet. Like they are, every time they fight, their lifespan gets a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter. Like the damage that they do to their bodies, to their head, to their brain is immeasurable. And so for a guy like him to have a moment like that where he just kind of seemed like a human being who cracked after a very heart-wrenching defeat, just like each and every one of us would crack, actually made me respect him more. Hanging in the balance after AJ versus Usyk is obviously Usyk versus Fury to unify the heavyweight division. How do you see that one panning out? He's quite big, he's quite long, he's quite tall. Um, I hope it happens. It seems like it's going to happen. I enjoy Tyson a lot. What he has done uh, over the last few years coming to the United States has been tremendous. Uh, what he's done for mental health awareness, his story, inspiring. I wish he would chill on the retirements. I mean, it's like every week, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. It kind of takes a little bit away mm. from it all, especially when we don't believe that he's... I didn't believe him when he retired after the Dillian White fight. I didn't believe him when he retired on his birthday. I just wish... I don't know why he does that. Um, but yeah, if I had to pick someone, look, I feel like we've been uh, underestimating Usyk for a while now, maybe because he's a bit of a smaller guy, but what makes him so dangerous is that he's a bit of a smaller heavyweight, which makes him a quicker heavyweight, right? Uh, so I love that matchup. I would love to see it. I still don't believe, by the way, that Usyk, excuse me, that Joshua Fury is never going to happen. I really still don't believe that it will never happen. I, I still like there's still, I feel like there's still a possibility. I'd love to see Joshua fight Wilder if Wilder, even if Wilder loses his next fight coming up, I don't care. Joshua's coming off a loss anyway. Uh, but even if he wins, I would still love to see it. And then Fury, uh, Usyk would be an incredible scene. I hope it happens here in the UK. It doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Unlikely, I think, isn't it? I know, and it's, it takes something away from it. I'm not going to lie. Like, it doesn't, like that, the crowd, the, the scene, it would just, what, compare the Joshua Usyk scene in August to what we saw at Wembley, right? For Fury. It was, I mean, no comparison. No comparison. Yeah, and so yeah. I get it. There's so much money, but just as a fan who's not making any money off of all of this, I would love to see that happen in the UK. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. If I had to pick someone, I'd probably pick Fury via decision. 
one British fighter who was successful recently in bringing home the gold was, of course, Leon Edwards, who became only the second UFC fighter from Britain after Michael Bisping to win a title in the UFC. I mean, that knockout against Usman was just next level, wasn't it? One of the greatest moments in the history of uh, MMA, one of the greatest sporting moments that I've ever witnessed. What a story, what a guy. Um, this guy has been screwed over left and right. Uh, people didn't give him a chance. People said he wasn't worthy. People wanted to write him off. People were trying to kill him off, trying to put him in the worst spots possible so that they can get rid of him. Said he wasn't interesting, said he wasn't personable, said he couldn't connect with the audience, was booed by the British fans in 2019 at the O2. And it's Leon Rocky Edwards who has elicited this incredible emotion and passion out of the people. No one else has been able to do this in this region. Like the reaction that I've seen dare I say, was greater than the reaction when Michael Bisping won back in 2016 against Luke Rockhold. Truly an amazing moment and an amazing thing to happen to a guy who, I mean, dare I say, no one deserves it more than him because he has had to eat a lot of crap sandwiches, if you know what I'm saying, mm. over the last three years. And he was kind of like the symbol of, you know, everyone's been hurt in some way, shape, or form by the pandemic, right? Some at the worst possible level, Death, of course, lost. There's nothing worse than that. Others lost their jobs, lost this, lost that. This guy lost out on a lot of opportunities because of the pandemic. And it felt to me like he was in the world of MMA, whatever that world may signify, was like the poster boy for opportunity lost. And so to see him overcome, rise to the occasion with a minute left, the same final minute that screwed him against Nate Diaz, where he couldn't get the shine from that win a year ago, in the most random place possible, Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah, for him to do that and then to elicit that kind of emotion, beautiful. And I hope that he gets his, uh, his big homecoming fight here next year. And I hope this time the UK fans cheer for him because he deserves it. How likely is the prospect, in your opinion, of Osman versus Edwards 3 taking place in the UK and most likely at Wembley Stadium? Or is it more likely that his, his next task is Jorge Masvidal? I think it should be Usman. Um, he was a tremendous champion. He defended the belt successfully several times, undefeated in his UFC run up until this point, was so close to breaking Anderson Silva's record. Uh, I think that's the fight that makes sense. Obviously, I'd love to see the Jorge Masvidal fight, but I think it's a bit of a, it's a tough sell uh, considering the losing streak that he's on. Get him one win. Like I would book Masvidal Wonderboy next. If he beats Wonderboy, all right, and, 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 and Leon retains, I'm all in. But I think you need to get him one win to, um, you know, to sell that and to justify it. So to me, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer, if I'm being honest. The only X factor is if on September 10th, Nathan Diaz somehow shocks the world and beats Hamza Chemaev, I think that would be a gigantic fight, given how their last fight ended. And, you know, he beats Hamza. That could throw a wrench in the plans. Of course, he's a free agent, so they'd have to throw a ton of money his way. And I'm sure he'd be open to considering that. That's the only X factor for me. If he loses, then I say do Usman 3 somewhere here. Do it. You know, uh, Leon's coach, Dave Lavelle, told me he wanted to do it at uh, Aston Villa Stadium. And I think that would be incredible as well, like to mm. truly give him that, that Birmingham moment. But uh, Wembley... You know, the, the thing is with the UFC, they, uh, they're always hesitant to do these outdoor shows without a roof. Um, so I don't know, you know, when you're going to do it, April. It's, uh, it's Would that take some of the intimacy off a UFC event if it was in a, a massive, grandiose arena? I don't like think so. A... Look at these boxing events. Tremendous, mm -hmm. right? The, the ring is kind of the same size-ish. Uh, I was at an event, I was at two massive events, one in Toronto, UFC 129, 55,000, and then UFC 193. 129 was way better than 193. 193 was in Melbourne, Australia. It was also in the morning, so like the crowd was kind of late arriving, um, but it's fine. You watch the screens, you're there for the atmosphere. I think it would be tremendous. There are rumors, of course, of Jake Paul versus Anderson Silva happening. How do you see that one panning out? Yeah, I mean, it feels like uh, this is the fight that has to happen right now. It kind of feels like Anderson's the last boss in uh, Jake's crusade against MMA. Uh, it seems like it's going to happen. It's pretty close from what I'm hearing. And uh, it's not done, though. So, you know, there could always be the last two Jake Paul fights didn't come to fruition. Not really his fault. And I think it's unfair to 
criticize him for those fights falling through, but nevertheless, I think he has the right formula when he goes up against the MMA fighters. Um, because the MMA community gets involved, the media covers it, all that stuff. Anderson looked amazing in his two boxing matches since leaving the UFC. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., Tito Ortiz. Um, so yeah, it's great. I'm curious how the buildup is going to be because Anderson doesn't really like play those games. You know, he doesn't really take part in that stuff. So it's going to be really on uh, Jake to sell it. But I think Anderson's name alone will make this. You know, it's crazy. The last time I was in London was for Anderson Silva versus Michael Bisping at the O2 in 2016. If you would have told me in 2016, like a few years later, Anderson would be fighting some, you know, Disney kid, I would have laughed. So it's just amazing <laughs> how things turn out. But uh, kudos to Jake. He, he, he willed this into existence, and I think it will be a really big deal if it happens. We've seen with the, the inclusion or the advent of influencers, YouTubers in combat sport in general, with, we saw a KSI show at the O2 last weekend. Um, those involved in the MMA and boxing communities, there was initial kind of, how can I put it, reluctance to kind of accept those sorts of events or those sorts of people into the sport as someone who does continue to work and cover those sports. How, how do you feel about it? And do you think it's done a lot of good? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too bothered. I, I don't take all this stuff so seriously. There's a lot of people who get so bothered by this sort of thing. Um, obviously, the skill level isn't the same. And I'm more concerned if they are booking mismatches where it's like legit dangerous um, for the athletes. But if it's two guys who are O and O fighting each other, like, yeah, I know what I'm watching. I'm, I would never compare that to seeing Terrence Crawford versus Errol Spence or something like that. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, is it my first choice? Obviously not. Like, uh, I had a potential uh, opportunity to work that event, and uh, I just. I don't know. I, I think the Jake Paul versus Anderson, Tyron Woodley stuff like that to me is feels different, right? Especially because of the MMA connection. Uh, when it's like these kids who honestly I don't really know. It's not really my world. It doesn't really do the same for me inside. I'm a fan of stories, characters, personalities, and they are that. I just don't know about them. I'm not emotionally invested in them like I am a Leon Edwards uh a Patty Pimblet, you know what I mean? Mm. So I really don't have a problem with it. I don't see how it's doing any harm. I think anyone suggesting that it's hurting boxing or combat is taking themselves way too seriously. I would actually strongly suggest that it's bringing new fans to the sport. Uh, I think Jake has done that. I think his brother Logan has done that. I think KSI has done that as well. So, yeah. I was at the O2 last Saturday and the crowd was 80 to 90% teenagers but the atmosphere was unreal and the likelihood now of those same teenagers going into a boxing or MMA gym this week or kind of investing in their health or just maybe paying to watch boxing or mixed martial arts in the future is probably astronomically higher as a result of an 100%. event like that. Yeah, yeah, because kids are impressionable, right? So when they see Lionel Messi play, they want to emulate him. When they see Kevin Durant play, they want to emulate him. Tom Brady emulate. So now they're seeing people who are stars relatively close to their age, who are doing huge things. Selling out the O2, that's a huge feat. That's a massive deal. They're not selling out ballrooms. And now they want to go out and try to emulate them as well. How could that be bad, right? Mm -hmm. um, learning self-defense, getting fit, things of that nature. So again, if it's uh, scripted or if it's mismatches, things like that, if it's ruining like the true sanctity of the sport, of course I'm against it. But if it's just a bunch of people who are at the same level going toe to toe and it's all in good fun, I have no problem with it. So looking forward to Clash at the Castle, which I believe is Saturday the 3rd, isn't it? Yeah, this Saturday. Um, Saturday the 3rd. On BT Sport. On BT Sport. Um, Big day for BT Sport. Same time, Clash at the Castle, Castle and UFC Paris happening at the same time. Football earlier that day as well? Yes, yeah. uh, Nottingham Forest going up against Bournemouth. Bournemouth? Bournemouth. Bournemouth. Bournemouth, yeah. Look at me. They should be able to bounce back from that defeat to Man what City defeat? last night. That was a moral victory, all right? <laughs> we went in there, we showed them who's who. That's called the rope -a dope You understand? You know what rope -a dope means? Like the old Muhammad Ali. They uh, think that they're better than us, right. but then the next time they come to city ground... So lulling them into a false sense of security then? 100%.
Holland, you, you way should, overrated. You should give Steve Cooper his next team talk for Forrest, I think. I would love to. Listen, you can't lick your wounds. You can't get down. Newly promoted. Bunch of new players. Need to gel. Need to be a cohesive unit. They went in there. They, they, they fought their hearts out. The fans were amazing. A couple of mistakes here and there. They'll bounce back. To me, that like people want to rub it in and say, oh, 6-0, this and that. What did you expect? It was City. All right. They've been together for the last few years. They're the defending champs, all good. We're the new kids on the block. And yes, I said we. That's okay. <laughs> I, I really feel like when Man City goes back there uh, and they play at Nottingham Forest, it's going to be a different result. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you, and I hope you enjoy uh, my home nation of Wales as much as uh, Can't wait. It's everyone It's going to be great. Drew McIntyre against Roman Reigns. What a scene it's going to be. Uh, and, and perhaps there'll be shades of Davy Boy. Red Heart back in 92. So thank you for having Fingers me. Fingers crossed. It. Fingers crossed. Cheers, Ariel. Thanks very much, man. Appreciate it. Cheers.